ําหรับ <coughs> กำหนดการสั้นๆน,นะคะในวันนี้ตอนช่วงเช้าเราก็ได้รับเกียรติจากวิทยากรจากองค์กรชั้นนำจากหน่วยงานซึ่งเป็นผู้ที่มีส่วนในการกำหนดนโยบายจากคนที่มีส่วนในการที่จะกำหนดมาตรฐานที่เกี่ยวกับเรื่องอผลิตภัณฑ์แล้วก็สินค้ารักสิ่งแวดล้อมนะคะได้ให้เกียรติกับเราตอนนี้ช่วงเช้า4ท่านนะคะที่จะมาบรรยายให้ให้เราได้รับฟังเกี่ยวกับประสบการณ์แล้วก็เกี่ยวกับแนวทางแล้วก็นโยบายในการที่เราจะทํำยังไงให้องค์กรแล้วก็การผลิตของเรานั้นเป็นรักสิ่งแวดล้อมนะคะในตอนบ่ายนะคะเราก็จะมีการเสวนา2ชุดด้วยกันนะคะก็เราเราก็มีในชุดแรกนั้นช่วงแรกเราก็จะมีท่านผู้ประกอบการก็จะมาบอกเล่าประสบการณ์กับเรานะคะส่วนในการเสวนาในชุดที่2นะคะก็จะเป็นหน่วยงานภาครัฐแล้วก็องค์กรต่างๆที่จะมาบอกเล่าแนวทางว่าจะช่วยเอกชนแล้วก็อุตสาหกรรมไทยเราให้ก้าวไปสู่การเป็น Green Supply Chain ก้าวเข้าสู่ AEC อย่างยั่งยืนได้อย่างไรนะคะอันนั้นก็จะเป็นกำหนดการสั้นๆน,นะคะสำหรับที่มาแล้วก็เหตุผลที่เราได้จัดการสัมมนาในวันนี้นะคะก็เป็นที่ที่ทุกท่านได้ทราบกันดีอยู่แล้วว่าในอีกไม่กี่ปีข้างหน้าเนี่ยนะคะเราก็จะมีการรวมตัวเป็นประชาคมเศรษฐกิจอาเซียนแล้วก็ทำให้ประเทศสมาชิกเนี่ยก็สามารถที่จะค้าขายสินค้ากันได้อย่างเสรีนะคะเกิดเป็นตลาดเดียวที่มีขนาดใหญ่แล้วก็เป็นตลาดใหม่ทีนี้เราจะคำถามก็คือเราจะทำอย่างไรนะคะกับการเปลี่ยนแปลงที่เกิดขึ้นหรือว่าอาจจะเกิดขึ้นนี้ว่าจะมีความหมายอย่างไรต่อพวกเราต่ออุตสาหกรรมไทยต่อประเทศไทยแล้วก็จะเราจะมีแนวทางในการปรับตัวอย่างไรที่จะรับมือกับความท้าทายที่กําลังจะเกิดขึ้นเราก็ได้เกิดขึ้นไปแล้วที่จะได้รับประโยชน์สูงสุดจากการเปลี่ยนแปลงในครั้งนี้ให้มากที่สุดนะคะทางหน่วยวิจัยสิ่งแวดล้อมของเราก็เลย <coughs> นําจะมานําเสนอแนวทางาการบริหารจัดการสายโซ่การผลิตรักสิ่งแวดล้อมหรือว่า green supply chain management ซึ่งอาจจะเป็นทางออกเป็นทางเลือกหรือเป็นคําตอบที่จะทําให้ผู้ผลิตไทยสามารถที่จะใช้ประโยชน์จาก AEC ได้อย่างเต็มที่นะคะฉันขออนุญาตเข้าสู่การสัมมนาเลยนะคะ um, It is my pleasure to invite uh, our first um, invited speaker Dr. Yoshiaki uh, Ishikawa from uh, Hitachi in Japan He is the senior chief engineer at Hitachi Uh, at the Environmental Strategy Office, and uh, as well as serving as the uh, chairman for uh, IEC TC 111 and ISO TC 268 SC1. Uh, Dr. Ishikawa has um, more than 30 years of experience working with uh, Hitachi in Japan, and um, he um, has established the Environmental Solution Center in the Industrial System Division at Hitachi in 2000. Um, that was aimed to offer the support and tools and uh, consultations uh, to the top management of environmentally leading companies in Japan. So he is currently a senior consultant in Industrial System Division at Hitachi and also a general manager in corporate environmental policy. And he has um, uh, various roles in international activities that uh, including the um, a lecturer for the uh, APO, the Asian Productivity Organization, and as I already mentioned, the uh, chairman of TC111 for the environmental uh, Conscious Design in Working Group 2. And uh, please, may I invite Dr. Ishikawa on the stage to present his talk. Thank you. Is this working? OK, good. Very good. I will use this. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to be uh, to invite me here, and uh, it's very much a uh, kind of pleasure uh, to provide you uh, the first speak, first talk from myself. Okay, thank you. This is the okay. All right, all right. And uh, Lisa Beam. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> as as introduced, 
I am working for Hitachi Group at the headquarter, which is my workplace is just in front of the Tokyo station. So if you have any chance to drop by Tokyo, please call me. I may uh, provide you a good uh, brew of uh, coffee. But uh, anyhow, um, the headquarter uh, of Hitachi Group uh, is in charge of uh, various kind of jobs which uh, covers all activities around the world, including uh, the Hitachi suppliers. And my uh, special uh, a, a responsibility is on the standardization, international standardization, as well as uh, the international compliance of uh, various regulations, mainly related to the products and services. So uh, the, today's um, topic concerning green supply chain is actually the central uh, mission of myself and my colleagues. So uh, at the beginning of, <coughs> of this session, I would like to provide you some very, the overall generic a view on this uh, specific issue called a uh, green supply chain. Uh, because green supply chain is not so much an easy task. And many companies and suppliers as well are struggling for that right now. And my hope or my ambition uh, from the point of standardization leaders is to provide you a nice tool uh, in terms of standards to address uh, this uh, difficult issue. Okay, so. Uh, I go to uh, the first, uh, okay, this is it. And I, you know, I have this uh, interpretation one within my pocket, but this is somehow limiting my action, so I put this. And then I start from, okay, this one. Uh, the very generic uh, definition of the supply chain. And as shown in this diagram, the, um, I think I'd better sit down. The supply chain and life cycle is almost equivalent. And uh, starting from the mining on top left one here, uh, we uh, extract raw materials, and that is to be processed, refined, and then it becomes some, somehow a material, like a metal. And then uh, it goes into the production uh, to make it a part, component of some uh, industrial equipment, whatever, like constructions equipment or electrical electronic equipment. Then, the, again, the manufacturer co combine them together to make a unit, like a printed circuit board. This is a unit, right? Or hard disk drive unit. Then, uh, a bit more uh, f larger, or what, what, what should we large? But, uh, you know, close to the consumer uh, type of company like our companies, assemble them and make it a final product, so to say, final product. So, all these products uh, previously are called um, intermediate products. And the final product is like a TV, washing machine, a computer, and these guys. And uh, the final product is uh, transported to the consumers or customers, and they use it in 10 years or half a year, uh, depending on the, uh, the characteristics of the product. And finally, they discard it. But right now, after they discard it, is also a big problem, uh, because it will have end of life stage as well. They, they can be refurbished or they can be disassembled and uh, maybe recycled into a new material again. And that material is uh, fed to the, this level, not this level, and that uh, makes the uh, total environmental impact smaller. But at, at the same time, this uh, figure shows two types of regulations. The regulations around the world, almost the same. The type one is maybe even right now most popular, like uh, ROHS directive in Europe, 
you know that very well. It is the uh, prohibition of the containment of hazardous substances within electrical electronic equipments like cadmium. It's prohibited. But it is applied only to the final product. So the washing machine producers are having obligation to comply with that. And they are checked, they sometimes fined, they are sometimes penalized, but it is only the TV producer, washing machine producers, those, those people, the final product producers, so to say. Of course, this is a supply chain program, problem, because this is long supply chain and all are related to the compliance of the final product. And I think that this situation is very common around the world right now. But some regulations deal with type 2. That covers entire life cycle as well. The typical one also in the area of substance extraction is the REACH, R-E-A-C-H, in, in European regulation as well. And that uh, poses obligations along the supply chain. All of the supply chain actors are under some kind of obligation. And this type too, I believe, is somewhat growing uh, these days. So this is the uh, sketch of the supply chain, life cycle, and regulations. This is one of the example I uh, copied from uh, the GHG protocol standard uh, published by World Resource Institute. In that, uh, this is, I think, still simplified, but this shows the somehow complication of the supply chain and life cycle of a motor, motor car, automobile, I mean automobile. And the, even one car is not so much easy because as you s see in this diagram, the chain is not actually a single chain, but multiple uh, kind of network, you know, uh, interconnecting each other. But still, we can see uh, some life cycle categories, raw material, production, distribution, use, and in life within those um, very complicated uh, network. And uh, this is, again, get back to reach and roads, and that shows the difference and the problems uh, associated with those regulation. This is one of the examples of the regulation of supply chain, but this applies to uh, various kind of different uh, uh, regulations around the world. Uh, the top box is within EU. Within EU, uh, REACH REACH applies a regulation type two, as I said before. That means all the actors in the supply chain are somehow regulated, especially uh, in terms of the uh, information of the substance contained within the product. It is uh, to be transferred from by all the actors along the supply chain. So the, uh, the parts producer or material producer has to provide information to their customer. Then the customer has to provide information to another past customer or himself. And that will ensure uh, the exact information transferred along the supply chain. So this makes everything very easy. The supply chain issues can be solved with these obligations along the supply chain. But the problem of us, like Thailand and Japan, we are exporting goods uh, to the uh, EU. So this goes to the regulation type one, and the roads and the reach almost the same. We are, you know, thinking about, you know, we are exporting some uh, printed circuit board to the EU region. Uh, we have to provide information of the printed circuit board concerning what kind of substances are inside. In case of ROHS, right now we have only six substance groups, lead, cadmium, uh, mercury, and uh, PBB, PBD, and uh, hexavariant he he uh, cr chromium, hexavariant chromium. That's it, very simple. But in case of REACH, uh, -E we have about two, 200 uh, 
uh, kind of uh, substances to be reported. And very much difficult. If we want to test chemical analysis on our product, produce target mode, concerning those 200 substances, the cost is very large. We cannot do it, actually. So we need some information from our supplier. If we are a produce target board manufacturer, we have to ask the um, capacitor provider, we have to ask the epoxy plate provider. All of these provider has to provide us those informations. And again, those providers, like even the you know, microchip, microcapacitor provider, combines many materials and small parts together to make that capacitor. Then they have to ask those suppliers again. And this is the problem because there is no obligation on the, on the lower part of the supply chain. We haven't introduced any regulation yet except Europe posing obligation of information exchange. So this information exchange must be done in a voluntary manner. And that is the question. Then this would be, I have felt, the mission of international standard. And then when we look at another aspect of the supply chain issue, it is not a substance, but carbon. The CO2 emission uh, these days has becoming a more and more important problem. And the concept called carbon footprint is very much getting popular and popular, and also being an agenda of regulatory issues around the world as well. And the uh, basic idea of carbon footprint is very much alike, uh, very much uh, similar to the uh, substance issue. Uh, we have life cycles starting from raw material to the end of life. And each life cycle stages, uh, we have CO2 emission. And CO2 emission may be created by the use of other input, like electric power, like a water, and some other materials at each of those life cycle stages. And electric power, of course, generates, emits CO2 to the air. And water, one cubic meter, requires a one kilowatt hour of an electricity. And that leads to CO2 emission as well. So we have to take into account all of those indirect CO2 emissions as well, uh, as far as it is relevant to a production and combine them together to report as a carbon footprint of a product. And so this idea obviously involves supply chain. This shows the uh, very uh, small numbers of examples already in place in somewhere around the world. And uh, in case of the uh, potato chips on the right hand side, it shows that the total CO2 emission is 75 gram. But it is strange, you know, because the potato chips does not emit any CO2. It is not a device, no electricity used. However, you, when you look at the bottom side, it uses, uh, it emits the 44% of the CO2 of 75 gram uh, from the potato farm. And the production uses electricity, 30%. And packaging, this is plastic package, so you need uh, some energy. Uh, and that leads to 15% of CO2 emission and so on. So this counts up all those CO2 emissions along the supply chain or the life cycle. In order to realize such a labeling, you can imagine Many people involved in the supply chain of potato chips manufacturer has to be involved, starting from potato farm. Do you think it is easy? I don't think so much. Because if I am a potato chip manufacturer, I only have some uh, connection with, direct connection with packaging company and production company alone. I don't know anything uh, other than that. Maybe potato farm is far from my company. I have to ask those information, but no connection with them. This is uh, the uh, real 
supply chain issue involved in CO2 footprint. So I would like to um, present you what we're doing under uh, the IEC TC111. Uh, before uh, getting into that details, I would like to uh, show you that there are three uh, major international standard bodies in the world, IEC, ISO, ITU. IEC is uh, called International Electrotechnica Commission, which deals with the uh, electronics and electrical uh, field alone. But it has the longest history. It started uh, more than 100 years ago, starting from the Ohm's law. You know that law, you know, current and voltage. Uh, that uh, the, the voltage divided by the current, or the other side, is called uh, Ohm or whatever, you know, that kind of unit name is the first deliverable, first publication of IC. Then uh, after 40 years, so uh, the, uh, 60 years uh, ago from now, ISO established. And uh, ISO is, uh, to my regret, very much famous. Uh, right now, I am doing both chairs of ISO and IC. But I've been long at chairing IC, so uh, I have a, a bit of uh, you know competitive feeling against ISO. Right now, n nothing. <laughs> but ISO is a bit younger, but more famous, and uh, especially uh, in the field of environmental issue, ISO TC two hundred seven is very famous because it developed ISO fourteen thousand one. I believe everybody knows it right now, and. Uh, in contrast to ISO TC 207, IEC started our environmental work uh, eight years ago. Uh, that is the TC 111, and that is what I am chairing right now. And the remaining one is ITU. ITU is not so much famous, but among the government people, ITU is only one international standard organization which is under the government uh, initiative or United Nations. And that is with telecommunication mainly. So the reason you can uh, talk to your friend over the phone, overseas, that is uh, because of the ITU standards, the interoperability of the telephones around the world. But this ITUT recently changed its activities or widened its activities to uh, more business areas as usual, you know, kind of uh, issues. And uh, they started SD5 uh, that is titled uh, Climate Change and Environmental Issue. So these three are right now working each other. And under the WTO rule, these three standard bodies are acknowledged as, so to say, international standard. So everything we deliver can be used for each national uh, committees, each national members' um, regulations, or whatever, uh, formally. And uh, in the TC111, as I said, eight years ago it established, or even nine years ago, and the uh, title is Environmental Standardization for Electrical and Electronic Production System. So this is very wide. If you look at the TC207 of ISO, it says Environmental Management. Environmental management is a bit smaller, but because it excludes the product standard for environmental issues uh, in, under environmental issues. But our title covers that as well. So we can produce, we can develop the product standard uh, concerning environmental aspects as well. And, uh, but this scope is broad, basic, and horizontal. We do not create any standard addressing specific product like a washing machine because there is already uh, TC59 which deals with the uh, washing machine. So uh, we do not infringe uh, their field of activities. We produce very generic environmental standard which can be applicable to all of the products. Uh, we held many meetings like this and uh, as you see here, uh, more than 100 uh, delegates from each national committee are participating always every year. And right now we have uh, 33 members 
and like you know here and I, I even myself uh, do not exactly know what these abbreviations mean only two you know alphabet allowed uh, for uh, suggesting the national committee AU means I believe Australia but uh, uh, like DE is, not, is German German is not G but DE uh, UK is easy but <laughs> these are quite complex but anyhow as, as this chart shows that many national committees are actively participating in, including Thailand, of course, uh, to help uh, IEC uh, provide uh, useful international standards, including useful for green supply chain issues. And this is uh, the structure of mapping of our uh, activities, but I skip this one and go to this one, the structure right now. Uh, we published or are uh, working on uh, various kinds of standards, but uh, those boxes uh, painted in uh, pink, very much relevant, are very much relevant uh, to the today's topic, green supply chain, the material declaration, and uh, recyclability and greenhouse gases. I will present to you briefly these ones. The first one is material declaration. This is already published under the number of 62474. And uh, this one is the standard itself. This was published uh, the uh, March last year, so uh, quite new standard. It is, I believe, still under uh, the uh, penetrating uh, phase uh, in each country. But I believe that uh, this is also uh, getting famous in your country because this is obviously aiming at uh, the solving the problems of green supply chain uh, associated with the substance issue. The most important part of this standard is uh, the database, which is maintained by validation team 62474VT. This validation team is existing even right now, working on the update of the substance list to be declared in this format. The substance list is very essential because it is not easily identified. Any substance is pretty much difficult to identify around the world uniformly. Each country has its own name. Each country has its own code uh, for a specific substance. So we determined that listing those substances is the only way of identifying the substance itself. So we are working on the list of those substances and uh, that is uh, only one identification of the substance within the IEC world. And using those lists of substances, you can declare the material associated with uh, the uh, substance containment. This is one of the example. The left hand side is product and um, product part, sorry, the product part here, and then the, the next one is material, and the substance group and substance. And this is about a very small capacitor chip, only weighs uh, 0 0.1 gram. But even this tiny chip, it has three parts, components inside, active part, termination, and uh, encapsulation. And the uh, active part is very important, but, but it weighs only 6.5% of the total mass. It's made of ceramics 100%. Within the ceramic, there is uh, the uh, mangan oxide and nickel oxide, cobalt oxide, each 64%, 17%, and 15%. These are the declaration. In the case of termination, uh, there are different kinds of uh, materials inside. Plating, glass, soda, lead. And uh, of course in the soda, it contains lead compound. That is actually prohibited. 
more than 0.1 percent. And uh, but this shows 97 percent lead or 9.3 percent lead in the glass. This is maybe a uh, infringing uh, the ROHS regulation directive, but it says that this is an exemption. Exemption in the ROHS directive number five applied. Exemption number seven A applied. And this kind of information is the example, a example of material degradation. And you feel like this is quite helpful. But the point is, everybody along the supply chain, around the world, has to use the same format like this. And this is the very much a value of international standard. So you can ask anybody, provide information based on this IEC standard. This is international standard, so harmonized one. Everybody around the world agreed on that. So please give us this information based on this format. It is OK, quite acceptable. And also, if you are asked by your customer, provide information in another form, you can insist. We only provide you international standard-based information because it is international standard. What you are asking is somewhat selfish. You know, you should, you should respect the international standard. And this seems to be sufficient because this is based on the international agreement. And this makes everything easier is what I expect. And this one is the, the another issue, GHG, greenhouse gas. Uh, this work led by uh, the Japanese Industry Association because we are quite a CO2 conscious kind of country. Also having some uh, problem of the lack of power after the massive earthquake. So uh, the, uh, the people around the world agreed on that. The Japan is a very nice a delegate to uh, take the lead in this uh, field of activity. And we are producing there are two different kinds of uh, uh, the standards. One is the carbon footprint I have just uh, presented to you and almost completed, and we're waiting for the printing. The carbon footprint itself, uh, if I get back to the, that kind of uh, one, for example, this one, uh, it is not so easy for uh, industry product like uh, home appliance. This is I said difficult, but relatively easier because uh, ch uh, potato chips has a shorter supply chain. But if we do this one like an uh, automobile, you know, obviously very much complicated and difficult. So from the viewpoint of electrical electronics manufacturers, we developed a, our own standard uh, for dealing with carbon footprint. And we expect that uh, this document makes it very easy uh, for our industry, especially, specifically our industry. And the, the seven to the six is another document, uh, which is aiming at, uh, what should I say, the uh, let uh, industry people, especially energy intensive industry people, to still contributing to the reduction of CO2. What I mean by this is that, for example, uh, assume ICT industry, like an IBM colleague, you know, he's working for IBM, and IBM is uh, selling uh, servers or data centers, but the data centers are using, consuming a huge amount of electricity then they are you know, susceptible to be criticized like that. You are contributing to green uh, house gas warming effect. But when we look at uh, the role and function of the green data center, oh, sorry, the data center itself, it can control traffic very well. It can control uh, the water supply appropriately to the city. They can control the smart grid, you know, they can change the demand and supply every minute and make an exact match and waste of electricity can be minimized. So utilizing such a intellectual information communication technology then contribute to the reduction of CO2 as a whole 
in the society. And some estimates say that is 20 times even greater than the real emission of CO2 from the data center itself. But this is not standardized at all. So sometimes people criticize us. It's a, it's a selfish talk. It's a greenwash, kind of. So uh, we are tackling with the ad delivering this kind of uh, international standard. And the final one I'd like to show is uh, recyclability. End of life. End of life is also a chain. It is not a supply chain, but what we call is end of life chain. And we believe information exchange at least needed for the end of life chain for a proper treatment. If the manufacturer does not provide a proper treatment information for the recyclers, it will be leading to a pollution. So these standards already published uh, define that uh, information exchange. And at the same time, it also provides the calculation methodology uh, to estimate uh, the recyclability of your product. So if you design your product like a, like a TV itself, based on the blueprint of the TV, you can easily estimate how much percentage can be recyclable. Uh, this uh, standard also tells you that kind of uh, methodology. And this was already utilized uh, to a large extent by European Commission in the paper for next uh, policy for uh, products. So I expect that this will be much more used by everybody around the world. And uh, this GEMP consortium is the a uh, kind of uh, initiative utilizing the material degradation standard. And I think that uh, uh, Dr. Nujarin is also leading uh, in, in utilizing this consortium itself. And uh, the, uh, almost a uh, few minutes left. And then I go to the TC207 and uh, SG5, other than TC111. Uh, the TC207. We also have green supply chain activities. I am joining in TC207 as a pure expert, not a chairman. But I uh, always enjoying and uh, feeling that this activity is very important within TC207. One is um, uh, the ISO DIS uh, 1406, 1406, 46. This is um, environmental management and uh, water footprint. The water footprint, I haven't uh, said about it at all, but footprint is not only the carbon. The water is also under uh, the footprint kind of issue. Uh, the water usage is, for example, it's obvious in the washing machine. But if you produce a TV, it also used water somewhere along the supply chain in the upstreams. The water footprint has that kind of concept that the entire supply chain or life cycle is responsible for the water use and water shortage. And the uh, next one is uh, a, uh, maybe we go to the next place. Uh, 14067, uh, this is done by subcommittee seven, greenhouse gas management. And this is carbon footprint itself, the same as we did in the IEC. This is about to be published, I believe, as a technical specification, a technical report. And ITUT, I said at the beginning that uh, telecommunication field is quite active. They started SG5 titled Environment and Climate Change. And they already published a standard for methodology, assessment of the environmental impact of information and communication technology goods, networks, and services. This is far beyond the existing scope of the ITUT, but they were quite ambitious uh, to publish this standard. This applies to even uh, the electrical electronics appliances. But this is very good uh, standard uh, to provide you life cycle assessment methodology concerning ICT industry products. So uh, this is uh, uh, about my all of my presentation, and I hope that uh, this will be of good use for understanding uh, uh, the speakers afterward. But uh, I have a few minutes, right, for question and answer.
please give me any question you you like. ถ้ามีคำถามขอเรียนเชิญที่ไมโครโฟนเลยนะคะอาจจะ to ask anything. อาคาจัต do you have any question? No. Oh my God. <laughs> ขออนุญาตขอไมโครโฟนนิดนึงนะคะขอบคุณเพื่อที่ทุกท่านก็จะได้รับฟังคำถามด้วยขอบคุณค่ะครับ thank you well the water footprint is it's more or less along every every process even making the water of all that probably consume about two or three times before one bottles of the water I believe so yeah how how can mankind can more or less reduce more or Close to the zeros, uh, 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 what you call uh, concern of water footprint. Okay, so you ask for the methodology concept of the water footprint. Yeah. Okay, as you said, it is far more complicated than the greenhouse gas footprint because the water is not uniform, and so even if we have uh, sufficient information along the supply chain. The calculation of the water footprint is not so easy, because the water volume, even if the water volume is the same as one cubic meter, its environmental impact would be very much different from place to place and season to season. So, uh, the right now, this document has a very broad framework outline of the water footprint methodology, like the each cubic meter has to be. Uh, translated into the environmental impact, which is regional specific and time specific. In the case of you know Thailand, in the in the rainy season, water is abundant. I think too much abundant, and in the dry season, water is scarce. Our central China region, they have a severe lack of water for the drinking water, so. These uh, aspects, these situations, has to be taken into account to transform each cubic meter into the footprint. So the water equivalent kind of cubic meter is to be used, but it doesn't say any concrete suggestion how to do that. So this standard may be published shortly, but we have to develop more guidance documents, actually applying. Such kind of uh, concept into the real uh, operation. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other question? Doctor Ichakawa-san, yes. may I ask some question regarding sure. to the the new standard IEC uh, for the uh, material declaration? And the, uh, for the uh, greenhouse gas okay. uh, standard, do you foresee these two standards will be some kind of a non-trade barrier for the okay. uh, future uh, uh -huh. trade between uh -huh. uh, internationals? Thank okay. you. Okay, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, 747 substance won't make any trade barrier, but rather it makes the barrier smaller. Uh, to exchange information along, along the supply chain easily with a lower cost, even for the small medium companies uh, around the country, uh, around all the countries, including developing countries. But in the case of carbon footprint, there are some problems already raised because the final results of the carbon, like 75 gram, it is somehow disadvantageous for uh, for example, African countries providing vegetables to Europe. They provide uh, vegetables the first from Africa to uh, Central Europe, but uh, they use uh, air flight to make it fresh. And it is actually very much appreciated with high cost. However, the carbon footprint is very large because they are using an uh, air jet plane. So uh, they are pretty much against the idea of carbon footprint of uh, naively used, you know, like this. And uh, this is uh, uh, having a potential of becoming a trade barrier. So uh, in the ISO, 
uh, we are discussing uh, about the possibility and how we can uh, avoid uh, such a trade barrier situation nicely and promoting the businesses more. So uh, half yes and half no, and uh, we are struggling for to avoid such a trade barrier situation. Thank you very much. Ishikawa-san, yes. uh, could you, as a chairman for the IEC TC111, also uh, subcommittees for the um, ISO yeah. on the environment issues, mm. uh, can you discuss a little bit or comment a little bit on the, the roles of Thailand or oh. Thailand companies in the uh, international standards okay. and how would they mm. uh, do something or take part of the international okay. standards okay. so that they can address their problem out there? Okay, um, I think that uh, even uh, so far, you know, like uh, Dr. Akajate and uh, Dr. Nijaling, you um, participated in our standard work and um, played a very important role, contributing a lot as an expert. So I have to say uh, thank you for all of you, but I also expect that um, the uh, other participants from the industry, not consultant or the government people like you, participate in our work from the viewpoint of uh, the supplier side. You know, you, you, you don't have so much a big OEMs, you are uh, the very important uh, uh, the uh, kind of industry providing a intermediate products around the world. And in that sense, uh, it is not so much a frequent under the ICU or ISO world to lead a, some development of a new standard. But uh, what I feel is that there should be more uh, new uh, proposals of uh, new standards from the viewpoint of uh, suppliers' side you know, the, uh, fitting to, the, to this theme. The supply chain issue cannot be standardized only from the viewpoint of uh, the OEMs, but it must be also from the viewpoint of suppliers. And I believe there are much more, you know, interesting and valuable uh, standards proposed uh, from Thailand, uh, industry people, and I'm willing to help uh, your proposal if it comes up. Thank you very much, Dr. Ishikawa. I think uh, that's what we have time for your presentation. Thank you. Shall we thank uh, again Dr. Ishikawa for his uh, informative uh, talk on how the standards, international standards can help uh, the uh, supply, green supply chain. Uh, Dr. Ishikawa has activity of TC111 ได้พัฒนาเอ่อสแตนดาร์ดมาตรฐานอะไรบ้างที่เกี่ยวกับสินค้าและการผลิตสินค้าสิ่งแวดล้อมนะคะเอ่อท่านก็ได้บอกว่